So that being said, let's jump into the scriptures. And uh, speaking of <laughs> what God does through the parables, are really a, I think for anyone with ears to hear, as Jesus said, he with ears let him hear. And with anyone, for anyone with ears to hear, these parables are going to be a serious call to uh, self evaluation. That's, that's the regular part of a disciple's life, the self-evaluation. Because every time Jesus speaks, that's the mirror that I get to look at. And I, and I look at the mirror of his words, and I say, so how am I looking? You know, uh, here's, here's Jesus and who he is and what he's thinking, and here's me. So how do I become more like him? So we're going to be in Matthew 13, 44 to 46 for the, the two parables for the evening. But before we jump in, I want to make sure we remember the momentum of the last several weeks. I changed your number on the top of your page to session three because I didn't change it on the computer. So, so we're going to review what we've looked at the last several weeks. Uh, to begin with, what does parable actually mean? Comparison. Yeah, it's a comparison. Very literally, it means to to throw beside, to throw next to. And so you, that's why it's a comparison. It's two things put next to each other to see how they're alike or similar. So that's what the parables are. And remember, parables aren't just stories. Those are the ones that we remember probably most. But parables are all kinds of metaphors, figurative language of all kinds. In English, we call it metaphor simile. In that language, parable covered all of it. A parable covers a riddle. Mysterious words that you have to just think about and figure out, what, what is he talking about? By the way... That was the effect of most of Jesus' parables on his disciples. Not just the crowds, on the disciples. That was their job, was to decode his mysterious words, and they, they just couldn't do it a lot of the time. In fact, we saw with two of the parables so far, the poor and the weeds, Jesus had to explain the parable because they couldn't get it. They tried their darndest, they couldn't get it. Hey, speaking of those parables, in the parable of the sower, uh, Jesus talked about the path, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil. Just share, share with us, if you remember, what does the path represent? What kind of person is this? Satan. Well, the birds that came swooped up, yes. So Satan swooping up and eating the seed of the word. So what kind of person is this? What's going on with this person? They've heard the word of the kingdom, but what? Right? It goes nowhere. Because the enemy has played a role, and human rebellion is the other part of that, of course, but the word doesn't even have a shot. It doesn't have a chance. Nothing happens. They reject it. The second soil is rocky. Um, and in the parable, this is the one where the seed actually does grow to life, but the rocks prevent it from getting deep roots, so when the sun shines on it, the heat scorches it and it dies. So what is Jesus talking about? What does that represent? Or what kind of person? Yes. Good. So they, they believe it. They receive this message of the kingdom. Do you remember what the sun or the heat represents? What causes them? That's it. You got it. This is why you keep root. Yeah. So their acceptance of the kingdom message is limited to their own welfare. As soon as receiving this message is, is a threat to their welfare, they're out. And so that, here's the problem, and we see this a lot. If the kingdom message is received, and I think it's about me, I'm already in trouble. <laughs> because as soon as the me is threatened, never mind. See, when you receive the kingdom, remember, who's the kingdom message really about? It's about the king. So, if it's going to hurt me, but it pleases the king, let's go. Bring it on. But see, if the kingdom message is received about how it will help me, and that's the main thing, as soon as I don't think it's going to help me anymore, I'm out. Now, how about the uh, thorn soil? Jesus talked about how the, the seed came to life, it grew a plant, but the thorns grew with it and choked the plant so it couldn't bear a harvest. What does that represent? It's not as a vine. Good. Uh, remember, the, the rocky soil is about, I'm afraid to lose. 
the thorny soil is I want more. And so, yeah, Jesus talks about the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth. I think it was in Luke, it adds one, uh, the desire for other things. So this is the one that's happy to have the kingdom, but I want more than the kingdom. I want the world to. I want, and so again, it, isn't that the selfish kingdom? <laughs> as long as the kingdom helps me get more, I want it. As soon as the kingdom means I'm losing out on what I want, I get it. I'm out of here. Keep that one in mind for tonight. That one's going to come back on us like a boomerang. Now, the good soil represents what? Follower, believer. Yep. Someone who actually is willing to produce the fruit of the kingdom which is obedience to God's word. No matter what comes. So, the enemy can't take the word from them because they believe it. They they will suffer for it and still obey God, even so. They're going to lose out on worldly things, meaning they won't get as much from the world as they might otherwise, and they're cool with that, <coughs> because it's about the king, not about them. All right, number three. I just won't keep talking about that because it's so good. But we're okay. Number three: Give the meaning of each of the following details in the parable of the weeds. So, just to review, remember: in the parable of the weeds, there's a man who owns this field, and he sows good seed in it, the wheat. Under cover of darkness, when everyone's sleeping, his enemy comes and sows weeds into the field, the darnel or the tares. Uh, it's undetected until all of this stuff grows up together and reaches a certain maturity. And then the servants are like, hey, master, you sowed good seed. What's with all the bad seed? Oh, an enemy did this. And what did the servants offer to do? He wants to go pull out the weeds. Master said, no. Why? When you pull out the weeds, you're going to pull out some of my good grain. I don't want to lose any of that. So wait till the harvest is ready. Wait till everything's fully mature. Then I'll have my harvester set. So, let's talk about what these things mean. What was the man sowing good seed representing? Son of man. The son of man. Good, you got the exact phrase he used, that's right. Son of man. We talked about why, why he talked about himself as the son of man. What does the field represent? The world. The whole world, right? Not the church, which is a common interpretation of that parable. It's not just talking about the church having good people and bad people in it. It's the whole world. And there will be evil in the world still. The good seed represents the children of the kingdom. Good. Which would be the good soil from the previous one, right? Who are the weeds then? Satan's kids. Children of the evil one. Remember, when we say children, what we mean is those who are like him. And the children of the kingdom are those who are like the king. Who's the enemy? The devil. Yep. Well, I'll tell you what, for a lot of Christians who don't take the enemy seriously, it's strange because Jesus really talked about it a lot mm-hmm. and really took him very seriously. The harvest, <laughs> how does that represent? End of the age. Very good. Dude, oh, you're rocking this not, thing here. I'm not smart. I have the dice from last week. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that makes me that, That's smart, brother. <laughs> Remember, the end of the age is when Jesus will return. And he will send out the harvesters. And who did he say they represent? The angels. The angels. The angels, he said, will weed out of his kingdom everything, or everyone who does evil and all the sources of evil. And then the children of the kingdom will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. I love that so much. Okay. Number four. This is from last time. We're adding that this last time mustard seed and yeast into this one. Remember that when Jesus told these parables... His primary goal was to correct some understanding of the kingdom that the Jews had that was not right. They were expecting the wrong thing to come. Because remember, Jesus said, the kingdom's here. And so he knew all these Jews are expecting certain things to happen now. And he's like, no, 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 let me explain. So when he told the parable of the sower, what was he correcting them about? What were they expecting and what was he saying was actually the case? Do you remember? They said they had cataclysmic change to occur when the Messiah came. He told them, these kids come in to be small and then we grow. All right, good. Actually, you're, you're ahead of us. That's the last <laughs> one. Seed, mustard seed and yeast. But keep that in mind. We're going to get to that one. How about the parable of the sower, though? 
with the different soils and which one produces harvest. Like, but remember, they were thinking that to please God or to give God what he wants to harvest is to obey the law. And now that the kingdom's here, God is going to honor those who have kept Moses' laws the best. You know, that was like 700 of them. Yeah, 600 <laughs> plus, yeah. yeah. Now, but remember, they didn't just stick to that, but he went to the elders' traditions and the oral law and all that. So this was a huge shift that Jesus was bringing. In this parable, remember what the seed was. It wasn't the law. What did he say the seed was? The message of the kingdom. Remember, what he was doing was changing the rules. <laughs> and they needed to know that. Because if they thought obeying the law of Moses is what's going to make us you know, honored by God in the kingdom, that was really going to throw him off. And that was his whole ministry, actually. Was was facing off with the religious leaders to, to clarify, guys, you're, you're keeping the wrong thing. You're rejecting the message of the kingdom because you want to hold on to what you've been doing this whole time. He's, and that's the whole uh, new wine and the old wine skins thing. So that was a game changer. It's about the message of the kingdom and Jesus himself. They are going to be the core of who's honored in his kingdom now, not the law of Moses. Remember, that's why it's so crucial that Jesus said in Matthew 5, I don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. That's why he can now be the center of it rather than the law, because he took care of that. He fulfilled it, completed it, so now he can be the center rather than the law being the center. Anyways, the parable of the weeds is actually similar to what um, the other one, the, the next one is. But remember, the Jews were expecting when Messiah comes, the enemies of God are going to be dealt with swiftly and finally. And just like we expect Jesus to do when he comes back. We are expecting at the return of Messiah what they were expecting at the first coming of Messiah. All the enemies of God are going to be done. Evil's God. It's God and his law and his people now. And that's it. So, Jesus comes, says the, the kingdom's here. But what is, he, what is he telling them in this parable of the weeds? The influence of the enemy is still going to be here. Do not expect God to take all evil out now that the kingdom's here. Don't expect that to happen right away. And 2,000 years later, we're like, well, yeah, he was right about that. Evil's not disappeared in 2,000 years just because the kingdom showed up. So what Jesus was encouraging them to do is be patient. It will happen, but not as soon, because what the servants in the story represent are the expectations of the Jews. Can we weed it out now? Now that the kingdom's here? And we weed out evil. And Jesus is the master in the story saying, no, no, no. we got to wait. It'll happen, but just not right now. That would be important for the Jews at that time. So they wouldn't give up on the kingdom message and assume Jesus was wrong just because evil hadn't disappeared yet. Now, finally, the parable of the mustard seed and yeast. Tell us again, Tim. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they expected it. Adequately change to occur when the Messiah came. People in his coming would be small, and then it would grow. When he fulfilled all the prophecies. Yeah, so the kingdom movement and growth would be far more gradual than they were expecting. That's why he talks about a mustard seed and yeast. Like this tiny little thing, this little this this poor Jewish carpenter man and his small band of followers. This is going to be the beginning of God's huge worldwide thing. And Jesus in his parable basically said, yep, go figure. <laughs> but oh, how big it got, right? Like the, the mustard seed picture is pretty spot on. Look at the way the church, look how large the, the message has become in the modern world since it started. Awesome. Anyway, that's the review. And I want, the reason it's important to review that is as we look at these next two parables, we've got to keep this in mind. All of this is, is tied together. Okay, so let's read the parables. And at the time we've got left, we're going to jump in and see what is Jesus talking about. All right, would somebody read Matthew 13, 44 to 46? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in the field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout 
choice pearls. And he discovered a pearl of great value. He sold everything he owned and bought it. Okay. So I'm just going to take a couple minutes. And what I want to do is just look at this as if it's a real story. And as if it really happened, especially the first one. Just so that we can kind of hear it a little more like the original hearers would have heard it. Because what Jesus describes in the first parable about the hidden treasure is actually stuff that happened in their world. Now, we live in a world of banks. Now, when we don't want to put something in the bank, what do we say? We stuff it under the mattress. Like, we have our own version of this. In the ancient world, you don't stuff stuff under your mattress. You bury it in a field. Your property. You bury it somewhere. Now, especially in Israel, poor, I mean, poor Israel, they were overcome so many times by different enemies, different invaders and stuff. It'd be, and that wasn't just Israel, but it was kind of an ancient practice. Even the Romans did this. If you want to keep something secure, you bury it out there somewhere. Of course, keep track of where it was. It reminds you of the pirates, doesn't it? <laughs> you got to make a map for yourself. It reminds you, where did they put that thing? And so that that's, was a common practice back then. Now, what we're, what we're hearing in Jesus' parable is something that his audience, his original audience, would probably be like, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, my Uncle Ned did that, or whatever. <laughs> like, so you, you own a field, you own property, and you hire someone to go out and dig, get the rocks out. I'm going to make a, a field here or something. So you hire a servant, they go out working for you that day, and as they're digging, clunk. Dig a little bit more. Ooh, what's this now? And they find the master's, the owner's hidden treasure. Now notice what Jesus says he does about it. He covers it back up. What a sneak. And by the way, the, the entire Jewish audience listening to Jesus knows this whole scenario is like dirty business. Okay? <laughs> this whole thing is like rotten. So he's working in someone else's field, finds this treasure while he's working, probably. He's like, oh. Oh, no one else saw it. Covers it back up. And then what does he do? Does he go tell the master, Hey, just want to remind you, you've got a treasure out there. What does he do? He sells. Now, this is a key point here. How does he get the... He's a servant, right? How does he sell, or how does he get enough money to buy this field? Everything he owns. Home. I don't know if he's got animals. Probably he's got a few animals. Like, Everything. He's got nothing now except the money in his hands. But when he buys that field, what does he have? Boom! He's got this treasure that's so much more valuable than anything he had before. Because if he had a lot of wealth, he would not have been working in that field for that guy. Right? So what a story. What a rags to riches story Jesus just told. Again, if you if you can't get back past the fact he's being a real cheat, <laughs> like, this is kind of underhanded what he does. That's not Jesus' real point. What is, what is he comparing? We're going to talk about that. Now, the second one doesn't quite have the same underhanded feel to it. It's just a merchant. We totally get this as Americans. We're totally business aware as Americans. So there's a guy, his job is to sell stuff. And he works in parable, or pearls. By the way, pearls back then were so amazingly valuable. They're still valuable today. But see, they, don't, they didn't have the methods we have of producing pearls. Right? Have you seen these things? They're weird. Online, uh, you can actually watch someone live on Facebook or whatever who's just got a bunch of oysters on the table. And you can watch them open up the oysters and you can basically claim that oyster. So if they open it and get a pearl, it's yours. It's weird, like this whole new phenomenon thing. Well, back then, obviously, that's not an option. And there's three main bodies of water that they would have to go at huge cost and huge you know, labor. They'd have to go find all these things and get these oysters. So it's amazingly uh, valuable. I, I, from one resource I read some time ago, it indicated they may have even been sometimes uh, more valuable than gold even, just because of the, the difficulty of getting it. So anyways, th this man, obviously, he's, he's doing pretty well if he's dealing in pearls. But what is he on the hunt for? Yes, a pearl of great value. And I go and put that me I want, you know. <laughs> when he finds it, one of great value. So now he's a merchant. So I'm I'm thinking it's not to just to keep it. It's because he knows that he can sell it for even more. Right? That's what merchants do. You 
buy it at a lower price, sell it for higher, and otherwise you're a bad merchant. You're not going to do very well. So in the first one, the guy wants the treasure for himself. In the second one, the merchant wants it because he knows there's going to be a profit in it. Now, I just wanted you to see this connection to the previous parables we've seen. In the two farming parables, what is the farmer looking for when he sows the seed? What is he hoping to get out of it? A crop. More than he put in, right? We call it a crop. He wants to get out of it more than he put in. With these two guys, in these parables here, why are they selling all they have to purchase something? Because they're expecting a profit. If, if I'm going to sell everything I have to buy a field, that treasure better be worth more than all the stuff I had the first time. Well, why would, why would I bother? And if the merchant sells everything he has to buy a pearl, and he cannot get the, that more value out of it than everything he owned before, it was a bad deal. <clears throat> So do you see this connection? And I, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't seen it until I studied this, this go-around. This idea of the prophet is actually all the way through all these parables. It's the key component, actually, to all these parables. So now, let's try to figure out what Jesus is getting at. Whether from what you've learned in the past or just sitting here hearing it and thinking on it now, what do you think Jesus is saying about the kingdom here? He's saying that, like, <clears throat> did the first guy finds me, put it a different way. I find this in a field in this book. And I'm looking at it and it's like, oh, this is it. I want this. As Jesus said to his disciples, drop everything you're doing and you come with me. You give, you know, tax collector leaves his big job. You give, you sell everything so that you can have the kingdom here. Am I taking on the right path a little bit or not? We're going to take it all in and then we'll decide. Oh, okay. But you're not crazy. <laughs> you're not off. I'm looking at it like this guy found, using me, found this mainly the New Testament. Okay. And oh, we got to get more of this. It's kind of like me selling things to buy tapes about this. Mm-hmm. Okay? To learn more. I gotta sell this because I want the word. Yes. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's it. That's enough. No, that's good. That's okay. Like, that could be. Any other that's thoughts? That's what I see. Okay. Covering it up, it seems like he wants to keep it to himself. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because if he doesn't, someone else might have snatched it before he does. <laughs> now, this is one reason why we cannot push parables too far. Parables are limited in what their comparison can tell us. That's one example. It's not like whatever Jesus is comparing us to is so limited that only one of us can get it, so we have to like hide it from everyone else. That obviously is not where Jesus was going with this. What's, what's another one? In the parable, you could buy the field with the treasure in it, and you could buy the pearl. Like You had enough capital, personally, to go buy this thing. What we have to wonder is, in the comparison to the kingdom of God, does Jesus really mean to tell us you have enough capital within yourself to purchase the kingdom of God? So again, you can't push the parable too far. Jesus wouldn't have expected you to. There's a a main point he's trying to communicate. The other details, you just kind of have to let them be. (laughs) Because there's no perfect parable. The one with the treasure, the, the treasure really, he's just buying the field. He's not buying the treasure. You're right. And that's that's like the kingdom of God. The kingdom is free. Comes with the field. Comes with. I think that's one of the. It's included. Things. You're saying. Yeah. How much are you willing to do? Whether you're willing to give up everything. Yes. Something. And isn't that the phrase that matches both stories? He went and sold all he had. He went away and sold everything he had. That. You, you have to pay attention to what was repeated in both. What was the common link to both? There are differences so between them. So it's what we're willing to give up. And, and the key here is all. Right? Right. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting difference. And again, I don't want to push the parables too far, but I wonder if there's some significance to this. In the one case, the guy doesn't seem to have been looking for it. We don't know totally. He doesn't give all the details. But it's, it, the way he describes it, it's almost like he happened upon it. In the second one, what's going on? He's purposely looking for this. Now, knowing Jesus' 
whole experience with the Jewish nation, knowing how Jesus interacted with everybody. One thing I wonder is if he was, in giving two different examples, if he was actually talking about two different groups of people. Because there were some sinners who had no interest in the law of God, no interest in obeying God, that when Jesus and John the Baptist came announcing the kingdom's arrival, totally caught them by surprise, but they wanted in. In fact, Jesus said they were getting in the head of the righteous people because they were listening. But then there was this group of people, and I think of Nicodemus who visited Jesus at, Jesus at night, and there were others who were religious leaders. In fact, there was one, uh, one religious leader who came to Jesus and said, I'll go with you wherever you go. So there were righteous people who heard the message, saw the miracles, and were like, I'm in. I want this. But see, some of them were looking for the kingdom to come. Others couldn't care less because they were living it up in this world. The end of the age just meant bad stuff for them. This present age is where they were wanting to live. But see, there's just two groups of people. One isn't looking for it. One group is looking for it. But the point is, if they both find it, are they willing to give up everything they have to acquire it? Now, here's another interesting thing about these stories. The, the obvi- obviously, the part of the story that isn't the focus is the fact that they found it. That's not the main thing. The main thing is what? They wanted to acquire it. Now, you have to think this through because for, for a lot of people, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom that we know, sometimes people feel totally satisfied because they found it. They heard it and they like it. So we'll go back to the parable of the, the souls. I like what I'm hearing. This makes me feel good. God loves me. God wants to forgive me. God wants to be my father. You know, all the good stuff, which I'm totally on board with that. They, they, they're happy they found it. But if Jesus ended the two stories there, so a guy found a treasure in a field. There's this other guy looking for pearls. He found a really good one. So, <laughs> who cares? The punchline of the story is not, look, they found it. The punchline is. They were so excited about it. They sold everything they had to acquire it. Now, you, you put that into the mix of Jesus' whole kingdom message and the parable of the, the soils, and you find out there's something really important here. The important thing isn't that you know the message. The important thing isn't that you like the message. The important thing is, will I follow that message where it's leading me? And that is a big part of this parable. Because the challenge, and this is why I said having anyone listening is going to be challenged to look at themselves carefully. The challenge here, especially for good church-attending Christian folk like us, is to actually stare honestly at ourselves long enough to figure this out. Have I actually been desperate for the kingdom to the point that I have surrendered everything I have to to have? And here's one reason why this gets a little bit complicated for us. Because we have the rest of the New Testament writings. And we have things that Paul wrote, for instance, especially Paul, that talks about the fact that um, by grace... You've been saved through, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God so that no one can boast. We are very, very clear on the fact that salvation or eternal life, I prefer that because salvation is so vague to people, what's that even mean? So eternal life is a gift of God, right? You cannot buy it. You can't earn it with your good deeds or your cash money, your church attendance. You cannot purchase this. You cannot make God owe you this thing. So then we have a really hard time coming up against so many of Jesus' actual explicit teachings about the kingdom where he indicates stuff like this. So the gospel is a gift, but it's going to cost you everything. Uh, what? So if I said, hey, I want you to have this, you name whatever it is you want. <laughs> I want you to have this car, uh, but you're going to have to lose everything if you want it. Like, it's not a gift. Like, it costs me too much to be a gift. So what do you do with this? Now, you're disciples. You want to take Jesus at his word. You believe Paul knows what he's talking about also. How do you bring those two realities together in your mind so that you can live in that reality? The gift of God's eternal life, his kingdom, all of that salvation is a gift. I receive by faith. In order to receive it by faith, I must lose everything to have it. What do you do with that?
Or is the Bible confused? <laughs> Did Paul and Jesus not see eye to eye on this? Like, what do you, you know what I mean? You know, I, I think, <clears throat> I think people understand that. They just don't know they understand it. For, and where I'm going with this, you see all these Facebook posts of uh, this really nice country cabin. We'll get, we'll get one million dollars if you live here six miles or six months with no cell phone and you do it. And everyone's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, so they, there it is. You know that if there's something good that you're willing to sacrifice for it. Uh, but the difference is that's in our minds, that's tangible. We can see it, touch it, smell it. In the kingdom, we can't simply because we're not walking in it to be able to see it. Not to mention, it's only six months versus it's just a flat out yeah. give it up. But the difference is, too, that million dollars, how long does it last? It, what you give up forever is going to be multiplied 60, 30, 100 times. Mm-hmm. But we, we just can't seem to grasp. Can't grasp that. that, that. I mean, it's, so, it's so real that because we can't see it, touch it, smell it. A million dollars is easy. Yeah, sure. And I know what I could do with a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I could make a list for you right now what I do with a million dollars. Yeah, because that's the other aspect of it is eternal life. People think less in terms of eternal life and more in terms of heaven. And now they're trying to picture what heaven is and what it means. And everyone's got their own idea of what it's all about. So it, what it does, I think, heaven, per se, in people's minds, just becomes another fantasy place. Sure. Like Clouds that. and angels and hearts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, you never, never land, whatever. Yeah. So I think that's why we're unable to do it. We just don't want to. I think it's a lot like get, uh, trying to give up smoking or drinking or anything like that. We get hooked on life the way it is, and it's awfully hard to to give that up because it's right here now. And it's just like people, I know, you know, people will try to give up. Maybe some of you have tried giving up smoking. I know, I know a man that, that gave up smoking when his daughter was born. And 21 years later, I was talking to him and he says, there wasn't a day I didn't want a cigarette then. Hmm. And that's, that's, now that's being hooked on like nicotine. But I think just the, our way of life, we get hooked on that and what is success and, and what people think is a great thing. And really... In the end, it turns out that all these things that we think are so great are just what's what's the Bible say? They're like a wisp or a, a vapor or yes. something. And the things that really are important, the kingdom, which is really important, because we don't, we really don't aren't dedicated enough to believe what Jesus said and and what the promise is. And, and uh, that's why so many people start, or the path is narrow. So many people start, and a lot fall by the wayside, detracted, or or whatever. Yeah. Why does it seem like you're talking like to give up everything? Because that's what that's what we're being called to do—to give up everything. But you can't ever outgive God. So anything that you give up will be will be. Given back to you, yes. thirty, a hundredfold, or whatever. But it's really, really hard to say that my home, my car, they belong to the Lord, and I'm going to put them. I had this van, okay, one time, and and I actually, I felt guilty because I had this van, the Toyota van, when it first came out, and it was like. So I said, I'm not going to feel guilty about this van. I have kids, and I, you know, I have this nice van. So I'm going to anoint it with oil, and I anointed my van with oil, and I put it into the Lord's service. Well, I had told that story about putting, and I didn't take, I took kids to uh, uh, youth group things like Far Away and things like that, and some things like that, and it's like, all of a sudden, this one woman came up and she asked me, she said, well, can my family, can we borrow your van? Because we all want to go to a Yankee game. Oh. <laughs> and I want my whole, because all my kids are coming back from college, and, you know, um, <laughs> Did you mean what you said? Yes, now, here we Did go. Did you mean what you said? Now the rubber hits the road. So I gave them my van. Mm-hmm. I gave them my van. And 
And my husband's like, are you nuts? Yeah, right. What's wrong with you? And I said, no. I said, I, you know, I, I, this is, I feel like it's a test. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a test. If they crush it, I have insurance, like whatever. So it really did bless that family. Um, it, 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 they, they're, I mean, this, these people were really involved in the ministry. I mean, their one son now that was in that band, he has this, this ministry in Ghana, West Africa. Wow. And they have built these, all these churches over there. And like, I mean, this is the shape of the cross, all these buildings and people come and they get trained to go out. To, to go. You know, and it was just, was, just, you know, so anyway, they, they went and they did their thing. And the whole time I was thinking, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my man. It's your man, Lord. It's All right. It was right. like that kind of like, you know, can we do that with everything in our life? Because that's what he's calling us to do. That's what he's calling us to do. Everything. Everything. You know? It starts with tithing. I mean, come on. How hard is it to give a tenth to the Lord? You know? And I'm not just speaking to anybody. I'm just no, I'm preaching right. myself. You know, yeah. you know tithing. It starts there. Give 10% to the Lord. You know? The hard thing about that is just. Is- I could do it if I was the only me. Well, I hear you, brother. My wife, my kids, that's what kills me. Yes. I mean, I could live in a tent and eat dirt. And you, and you know, Jesus knew this about people, especially the men he was talking to. And this is why he says in multiple places and, and ways, if you love your father, mother, husband, wife, children more than me, you can't follow me. He wasn't saying, because I think they're icky and I don't want them along. What he's saying is, if you're ever going to choose them over me, this is not going to work. Because of that very thing. He knows. Like, I'm the same way. I could live on pork and beans in a tent and be like, praise the Lord, let's serve him. But but (laughs) do I want to live with the idea that I'm dragging my kids and wife through this whole thing with me? And and I got to say, that's one of the most difficult parts of, not just America, but, but the affluent American West where we value family so highly one of the stumbling blocks to true, full discipleship to Jesus is this devotion to family that in a lot of ways keeps holds us back. And I don't mean that you should neglect your family. Paul would say you're worse than an unbeliever if you don't care for your immediate family. But our, our understanding of what's taking care of our family is different. I mean, in the culture, is different than the kingdom understanding of taking care of the family. To where... If I were to say to my kids, this is just an example, please don't hold me to this. Uh, if I were to say to my kids one, one Christmas, you know, uh, kids, we don't have a lot to start with, but I really feel strong the Lord wants us to uh, to send the money I would have spent on your gifts to to take care of some kids in Indonesia. I don't think one. Because they they don't not just have you no know, gifts. They don't have food and this. And I think we should bless them. I don't want to have to say that to my kids. But if the Lord Jesus told me to do that, now I have this discipleship crisis. And his words leap off the page, and they're not just an academic verse I should remember. It's it's this reality I'm about to live in. Am I going to, at the fork in the road, value Jesus and the kingdom over that moment that my kids are going to be horribly deflated and disappointed? Now, this is, like, real to me. I feel this. And these parables are, like, you know, in, in my face, because if I do what I want to do in the flesh, most people, Christian people, would not think a thing of it. Most people wouldn't come and say, now, Ryan, you know what Jesus said? Because I'm not breaking the big ten commandments. I'm not being bad to anyone. And so most Christians, <clears throat> because so many of us struggle with the same thing, we don't call each other on this stuff. So if I if I ignore what the Lord's saying and just carry on as I want to, I'll get out of it pretty unscathed, you know, in the in the physical. People aren't going to say, "No, I'll I'll get through it." The Lord will will challenge my conscience, but hey, everyone else does this, Lord, so it can't be that. Bad. You know what I'm saying? Like this is a tricky thing because of the standards the the wealthy American church has for each other. If you don't listen very carefully to Jesus himself, instead you listen to the church culture, you can miss a lot of this. So, so for instance, um, I know a lot of people who are more wealthy and have more stuff now than before they were Christians. And then 
Now, by the way, I'm not saying that that's a sign they're not a true disciple. But it comes to things like this where you're supposed to be willing to give up everything you have to acquire the kingdom. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means now. What does that even mean? Be willing to. Nobody's asking us. Nobody's asking us to give up everything. Nobody's asking us to be willing to. So yeah. when does that? I think he does test us. He <clears throat> okay. Does too. I mean, the whole van thing is a test for me. Sure. I'm willing to put that on the line. Yeah. You know. And I think the word everything here isn't specifically material. I think the word everything when give up everything is give up everything within myself. Because Jesus is always telling you, deny yourself and follow me. You have to pick up your cross, carry your cross every day. Deny yourself, follow me. That's the everything we have to give up. When we give up that everything, everything else will flood. And maybe, and, and then if we're we're blessed and have a lot, it's easy to give that up now because we've already given up what we desire for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're not being born again. You're new creation. Yes, with the old man behind you. I think the more, exactly you, right. the more you, the more you want to follow Christ, and the more you, the more you just want to pour yourself out because of how He has poured into you. Mm -hmm. And things are not important. What's important is Him and having a kingdom mindset. And that comes with the growth. That comes with following Him. That comes with falling more in love with Him every day. And, I think the groundwork for a lot of this was laid with uh, Abram and Isaac. You know, when we talk about giving up, when we think, I, I know I've talked oh, to a number of people, person. a number of people that get very upset that God had asked him to kill his son. And the whole time he said, the Lord will provide. And you talk about giving up your dear, your dearest I mean that's that's it. But he had enough faith in God's word because he had already hadn't he already promised to get that he would have more uh, ancestor what do you call it that would follow him than the stars in the sky and the yeah. so he's taking God at his word and I think he knew he had enough faith to know that God would provide and wouldn't take take the son away. But he was going to be, will it be willing to do it? When we talked about being willing to do it instead of actually doing it, and I, I think that's to me that's the groundwork in in a lot of this is in the New Testament. Yeah, that's a good example. You, you said it yourself about <clears throat> what each one of us is called to do. Uh, we saw that video uh, with uh, Tom Idol. You guys didn't see that one, and in it, this guy uh, he's doing well in the business world kind of ruthless at it, but he has a heart attack, almost dies and realizes and that's when he's called to the Lord. And so he's living very affluently and he sells the house, he's given up all the stuff, gives up his job, goes to work in the soup kitchen, has his teenage daughter work in the soup kitchen with him, and uh, she doesn't respond well to someone in the soup kitchen because they were treating her like a servant. She didn't like that. Mm, and right. she got angry and so he asked her, he says, why are you here? He said, and she said, uh, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to sell everything we own and go work in the soup kitchen? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? He says, no, that's what I'm supposed to do. Ah, uh, yes. Because I remember when I first watched it, I was like, why, why are you saying that? Oh, and then like the third time through I watched it's like, that was his calling. She has a different call. Good, very good. Was that fan or follower? That was, uh, what? which one was that? That was, uh. It was the six-part series. No, that wasn't fan or follower. That was the, uh, oh, what was that called? It was that called? It's good. Everybody should watch it. Too. That was a good one. It was a sick video. Yeah, they're 28 minutes long. Yeah. Can I read something to you? On, um, you were saying about Abraham. In Hebrews, um, it's chapter 11, 17. It starts out, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. Mm -hmm. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac. Like yeah. So even if he did, even if he did have him slain, he would, could still be yeah. he brought back. Yeah. That God's going to get me to the end, however it works. <laughs> I don't know which road we're going to take to get there, but he's getting me there. The disciples, Adam, they just walked away. 
yes. And what it says is just dropped everything right there. And, you know, mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Remember, he said to the rich young ruler, by the way, it's hard to read these parables without thinking of this. To the rich young ruler, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? Obey the laws? Ah, I do that. Okay, one thing you lack. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And you'll have a reward in heaven. And remember his response. He walked through the waves. He was always sad. sad because he had much wealth. Well, we're about out of time, so I wanted to lay this on you. Mm-hmm. And then say what you want to do. One of the reasons this has been a struggle for me to work through, partly because I don't want to, but the, <laughs> the other is an actual intellectual stumbling block. When we talk about having the kingdom, it's so big. What does that even mean, Lord? And so, so one of the things I've had to do is work through what are we really talking about when we talk about uh, giving all I have to acquire the kingdom. So I, here's what I've done in my mind, and you, you, you need to work on this yourself, but just to throw this at you. As I read through the Gospels and understand what Jesus is talking about, if you want to get to the nuts and bolts of what having the kingdom means, it means being a disciple of Jesus. That's, that's If you want to say that's the, the doorway to have the kingdom, right? Only disciples of Jesus have the kingdom. Well, even that's broad, and what, what does that mean? Especially, think about this, especially because we cannot do what we've been talking about, the first disciples did, physically leave things behind to physically follow a physical Jesus. Like, it's a different dynamic now than they had. So that throws another wrench in it for me because I can serve Jesus here in Phillipsburg, PA, and they can serve Jesus over there in, in Judea where Jesus used to walk physically around, and we're both serving Jesus equally and because the Holy Spirit's here now, you know, the whole thing. So that throws a little complication in. So I, I can't just park it here either because that's pretty vague too. So here's what has really helped me the most clarify. What does it mean? What does discipleship to Jesus really mean? It means becoming like Jesus. Even that's very vague and broad. So I kicked it down to one more. The mission of Christ. This now, if I if I take the mission of Jesus and I overlay it into what he's teaching me here, here's the question. Am I willing to give all that I have to accomplish the mission of Christ. Now we got some teeth, or something to dig our teeth into. So now I start asking questions like this. First of all, what is the mission of Christ? Make disciples, train disciples. And if you threw on a third one, it would be take care of the poor. I think that fits into the training of disciples, but we'll just put that very specifically out there. Now, here's my question. Have I, and am I currently, given everything to this mission? I can actually answer that question. See, this, I honestly can't answer. It's so big and big. Even this one. This, if I know what his mission is, my question now, I can answer it. Am I right now giving all I have to that mission? And I can say yes or no to that. And this is one reason why I think the hypothetical, would I be willing to, that hypothetical, is totally valid and true. But on the other hand, he's already told me to do certain things that I'm either doing or not doing. I want to give you one example that helps clarify it for me, and then I'll stop. Just this, I'll keep talking all night. Um, if you go to First Timothy, because this is especially applicable, I'm wrong, Second Timothy. Second Timothy. No, I was right. Well, was right. First Timothy. Go back. First Timothy six. Oh, that was that's wrong. Six, six. First Timothy six. Yeah. <clears throat> this is how Paul the apostle understood everything we're talking about tonight in reference to people who have much, and that's us. <laughs> We Americans sitting in this room, we fall into this category of those who love Christ and his kingdom, want to have it, but we have much. And there is an actual command here. It's not hypothetical. And I think your, your specific example of Anne fits into this general command. So. so the hypotheticals come around in this command here. But listen to what Paul said in verse 17 
to Timothy. Here's what Timothy was supposed to tell. First Timothy six seventeen. And here's his command to the rich people, those who have much. Command those who are rich, get this, in this present world. In Paul's mind, you needed to specify. Because <laughs> riches in Christ to him was so real in the kingdom level that he had to be like, ah, here's what I need. I mean, rich in this present world. Not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So here Paul is not saying, if you have anything enjoyable, shame on you. I love that. That's beautiful. But look what he does say. Command them to do good, presumably with what they have. Otherwise, why would this be specifically to rich people? <laughs> like there has to be something about what they have that, that they're allowed to do good with it. To be rich, I love this wordplay here, be rich in good deeds. <laughs> And to be generous and willing to share. And that's where that hypothetical comes. I'm willing to share. But you realize, don't you, it will not take long for the hypothetical to become real. Like you experienced. As soon as you say, Lord, I'm willing, he'll say, well, here you go. Because how many, how many needs are constantly around you all the time? And he says, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So they may take hold of a life that is true of life. To me, this, if you overlay this what Jesus said, it, it pops now. Like, it's like, okay, I, I can get this. So what Paul did not say is command the rich to sell everything and give it all away. He didn't say that. He said, tell them to take what they've got, do good, and share. Do good and share. So now, here's, here's where I, I'm left as a disciple of Jesus, taking all of this in. Because I want to obey him so badly. But I want to understand how, you know. So here's what this means. And I'm, I'm like simmering in the juices of this crisis in my own heart. With all that I've got, and that's a lot. I mean, it's not a lot compared to most people, but that's, that's a lot. Now I have to, with my family, my wife and my children, I have to, as a disciple, go to my master Jesus and say, how do you want to use this for your mission? What is the good? And it's that guy selling everything in suitcases, but maybe not for his daughter. But what is the good? Now, as soon as I'm, I'm sincere in this question to God, here's what I can bank on. He will tell me. And probably pretty soon. Now, here's the question. Will I? So now, I'm, I'm, I'm having to think that I have this, these new shifts at the second job I have. And I have a little more income coming in. Thank you, Lord. So our needs are going to be met. With a little bit extra to work on credit cards and all this stuff. So I want to be wise with our money. So now here's what the Lord's been saying to me like this whole time that I know this thing comes on its way. So look okay, right. Good. Be responsible. Pay down debts. Good on you. Who are you going to give to? I give to the church, Lord. Uh-huh. But who are you going to give to? Like poor. But what need are you going to give? Oh, Lord, can I just give it to the church? It's so much easier. It's simpler. I just write a check to FCOC. I am done. Because they'll take it from there. I have never read anything in the New Testament scriptures that indicates that if I write a check to the church, I'm done. Like, it's the opposite, actually. And that's why I love what Paul says here to the rich people. Do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. So now you need to identify the real people and the real needs that you are going to be used by God with all your plenty to go meet. So this is why I think disciples of Jesus have to be real clear. I'll end here. When you go back to the first parable we looked at, the thorny soil, that's exactly why I believe the thorny soil is our biggest threat. Because it means that I am making available everything I have, which is much, to the service of the mission of Christ. What's going to hold me back from bearing that fruit is when I love this stuff so much, I can't part ways. I was just reading in James, or James, like, James is one of the bluntest people you ever meet in writing. And he said, hey, adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
You choose to be a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Like he says, that's true. And he calls them adulterers because they love that stuff so much. So I'm just, like you said earlier, I'm saying to myself out loud what the Lord has been saying and thinking maybe someone else needs that same word. But let's reevaluate what have I been doing with my stuff? Not what am I willing to do in the hypothetical or wherever, but what am I doing currently that matches up to what he's told me, which is to do good, be generous and willing to share. That I can answer if I'm willing to. And uh, so, whoa. Anyways, that's, that's good stuff. It's deep. It's heavy. <laughs> but I think this is a game changer for a lot of us. If we take Jesus seriously about kingdom living, is constantly giving, constantly meeting other people's needs. I think for some of us, this would actually open up a whole new world for us in life of Jesus. It would just, it would really be like going from black and white to technical. Because this, you can't ignore this in everything he taught us. You know. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. And I love your sharing. Like everybody took part tonight, which is beautiful. I love that. So let me pray a blessing over you before we go. And the Lord, you stirred me up all over again. So I just offer this simple prayer. With what clarity my mind can offer it, that, that, Lord, you would bless my brothers and my sisters here in this room with, with the joy of your truth, the joy of your spirit speaking clearly to them. Lord, in each of their lives, they will need to make their own decisions about their own circumstances. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will show them with clarity what will please you. And then, Lord, will you give them the courage to do that very thing. Will you show us as a group and as individuals and as families who it is we can bless, what good we can do, what, what sharing needs to happen soon, right away. And Lord, I pray you'll break through the barriers in my own heart, a fear of what family members or anyone else might say to me. Uh, so give us courage, Lord, to obey your voice, trusting you with anything that might result from it. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.